Good evening. I'm Anita McBride, Chair of the Enduring Legacies of America's First Ladies Conference. Thank you for joining us tonight at the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library for the final session of today's conference, a moderated conversation with former First Ladies Barbara Bush and Laura Bush. I want to first thank Linda Johnson Robb for hosting us today. We appreciate so much your gracious hospitality, Linda. It's been a wonderful day here at the LBJ Library. Throughout the day, historians, family members, and former staff took us on a journey into the world of an American First Lady. We gained insight into the choices these women made to shape their work and support the president, their families, and our nation. This intriguing position has no job description, no statutory authority, and no salary, yet our First Ladies have extraordinary power to influence. And throughout our history, each First Lady has used her platform to advocate for issues she cares about and help advance our society in innumerable ways. The idea to more fully examine the role of an American First Lady and her influence on politics, domestic policy, and global diplomacy began with an inaugural conference at American University in Washington, D.C. in March 2011. That conference underscored the great interest Americans have in their First Ladies. The result was a partnership between American University, the White House Historical Association, and the National Archives Presidential Libraries to take our show on the road. Today's event marks the last of a trilogy of conferences hosted by the three presidential libraries in Texas. Although I'm delighted to announce tonight the plans are underway to host a next conference at the Ford Library in spring of 2013. But Texas holds a special place in American history with three presidential libraries, two living presidents, and two living first ladies. It was the perfect place to start this series. It's been a privilege for me to direct these conferences and work closely with the presidential library directors and their superb teams, as well as all the panelists and moderators and presenters who have lent their time and expertise to make these conferences so successful. Both Barbara Bush and Laura Bush jumped right on board from the earliest days of our conversations about this concept. Laura Bush was eager to bring it to Dallas even before the George W. Bush Library opened. And that was fine with Barbara Bush as long as we went to College Station first. <laughs> but the schedule worked perfectly to time this conference at the LBJ Library to coincide with events honoring Lady Bird Johnson's centennial in December. These three women knew and admired each other, and each has been a gift to our nation. We thank them for their service and their example of strength and family love and love of country. It is now my honor to welcome to the stage the director of the LBJ Library and tonight's moderator, Mark Updegrove, and two special women I deeply admire and to whom I'm grateful for giving me a bird's eye view to history. Please welcome former First Ladies Barbara Bush and Laura Bush. It's a vet you bar. They told me. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we are honored to have you here tonight. And uh, the, the, no one would have been more pleased about the conference today than Lady Bird Johnson. You can feel her spirit hovering over, it's almost palpably this evening. 
I know that she was an inspiration to both of you. And I wonder if I can start with you, Mrs. Bush, and ask, and by the way, uh, there's a little ambiguity in terms of the, so uh, Laura Bush has graciously allowed me to call her Laura for the evening, so I will be referring to her as Laura, and you as Mrs. Bush. <laughs> I would certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe according to Jenna, the enforcer. Uh, <laughs> Jenna Bush earlier today referred to her grandmother in that way. Uh, what do you most recall about Lady Bird Johnson, Mrs. Bush? Well, I, I came to, to, with my husband to the Washington. Lady Bird was so generous, you couldn't believe it. She invited every member of the 57 delegation, Democrats and Republicans, to come to the White House because she said she had never been upstairs at the White House, which seemed amazing to me. And she knew my mother-in-law, and she was very, very generous. I remember that. Um, we went and sat in the Queen's bedroom, and they told us all sorts of exciting things. And she was a wonderful, generous, loving, First Lady. I, she was my favorite First Lady until Laura became First Lady. <laughs> then she became my second favorite First Lady. That's high praise. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, you were actually, I, I, I said welcome, but I, I should say welcome back. Because if you read uh, Laura Bush's memoir, you will realize that she was here when President Johnson laid in state in January of 1973 lined up with the thousands of people who filed past President Johnson's flag-draped coffin. And you met Lady Bird Johnson that day. What, was, what do you recall? That's about right. That I was in graduate school here in library school when uh, President Johnson died. And in fact, one of my library school professors wept uh, in class because he felt like he, his education really that uh, President Johnson had made p possible for him with legislation that he had done for education. And then uh, you, um, Linda, and Lucy, and your mother stood in line as, as thousands of people lined up to walk through the library here um, as President Johnson lay in state. And so I was one of them. I lined up and, and shook your hands and shook your mother's hand. And of course, never expecting ever that uh, we would share anything in common, really, except that we were Texans and, and that we had been together that one moment. But then also I got to entertain Lady Bird Johnson at the White House. Really, when uh, George was governor and we lived here, we saw Mrs. Johnson fairly often. We hosted the opening luncheon on the governor's mansion lawn uh, for the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and then went that evening to the uh, opening gala at the Wildflower Center, and so I saw her some uh, during those years. But what I really remember was before that when your dad was president and uh, how proud I was of a Texas First Lady who thought our state was beautiful and who really did what, I mean, I think she really was one of the very first real environmentalists in the sense of using native plants uh, the, the, you know, plants that would be the hardiest, that would use the least amount of water, that would grow the best in all parts of our country. And so I was always really proud of her and, and had that same interest myself in, in um, restoring Native Prairie that we do now at our ranch and, and in Washington when, in the spring when the daffodils bloom, always being able to think of Lady Bird. So I always admired her a lot. We spent the uh, afternoon talking about the role of First Lady. Mrs. Bush, you were the second lady of the United States for eight years when mm -hmm. your husband mm -hmm. served as vice president to mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan. But I wonder, can any woman be adequately prepared for the duties of First Lady? Yes. I think you can. <laughs> if you're the wife of a governor, or if you're the wife of the vice president. Or if your mother-in-law is first lady and you've watched her for four years. I mean, yeah, I think you can. I, and I think it's a golden opportunity to do something. I think Lady Burb is the one who said, it, you know, it's an opportunity to do something good. And uh, 
if it by chance helps your husband, all the better. But <laughs> I, I, I think you can be prepared for it. And I was very lucky because I'd lived in Washington as the wife of everything. I mean, he was a congressman, he was the head of the CIA, he was, he was everything. He still is everything. But, <laughs> no, I think you can be, don't you? Yes, I, do, I really do think that I had a huge advantage because I'd been to the White House so often to stay with uh, President Bush and Barbara and because I'd watched Barr. And I really did know a lot. I mean, I knew things that were very mundane and, you know, how to do the Christmas card, the White House Christmas card. And every time, you know, I mean, I just knew how to do all of those things because I'd watched her and knew how she did it. The decorating for Christmas, I mean, all the... Did, did you tell them how you hadn't been in office of a month when they're coming and saying, what's the theme for next year's Christmas? Christmas? Exactly. You haven't unpacked your bags yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what surprised you most about the role after you took it on? How glorious life is to never have to worry about plumbing or electricity <laughs> or meals or, I mean, it's unbelievable. Or your menus or your Me shopping anything. or your food or anything. I mean, it's really great. And Camp David certainly, certainly was a huge thing that our husbands both used mm -hmm. to meet with people quietly and not have pressure and press. And I, I think that's, sort of surprised me the most about how easy life was. And oh baby, do I miss those 91 people who made my life <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly, Wonderful. moving home is quite the adjustment. <laughs> Don't Laura, George no do the staff. dishes? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he did do the dishes. Laura, what surprised you most about it? Well, I think home? really Lady, and I quoted Lady Bird often when she said she had a po that the first lady has a podium and she chose to use it. I think that was her quote. And I think really knowing that, I, it was after I made the presidential radio address about the, at the treatment of women and children in Afghanistan by the Taliban. And right after that, I was here in Austin visiting Jenna, who was at Texas. And we went shopping. And the ladies at the cosmetic counters, who worked at the cosmetic counter in the department store, came up and said, thank you so much for speaking for women in Afghanistan. And that was really the first time that I thought, hey, they heard me. And I, did, I think I knew intellectually that the First Lady had a podium, but I didn't really know it until after that. And I had knew what Lady Bird had said, of course. You sit on Larry King shortly after taking the role. You were just surprised about the impact. Were there other manifestations of that? Uh, after the radio address, you yeah. mean? Yeah. Sure, I mean, just the... The other thing, I got a phone call from one of my best friends um, and roommates in, in college who said that she had thought, after September 11th, I mean, she had thought that she was so glad she wasn't in my shoes. And then after September 11th, she said she felt a little jealous uh -huh. because she thought there were things I could do. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to do something. And everyone did. And that's what really I saw... Um, after the radio address were just ordinary Americans everywhere across our country coming up to say, what can we do right. and how can we help? And they really wanted to help the people of Afghanistan and the girls, especially and women who'd been denied an education. I mean, the very idea for us as Americans is shocking uh, that a government would forbid half of its population from being educated. And Americans wanted to help and still do. But you also comforted, you told people after 9-11 to comfort their children, to not forget that they were scared. And I thought that was wonderful. Well, I did that also because the first person I wanted to call was my own mother. <laughs> <laughs> you were a little old for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I did call her and say, Mother, we're fine and everything's fine, but really I just wanted her to say, yes, you're right, everything is fine. And hear my, the comfort of my mother's voice. And I knew that kids everywhere would want that. And I actually was just in Kansas City with a friend doing a heart truth event about heart disease. And uh, the woman who was the hostess for the big event said, I just want to thank you. She said, you told us to comfort our children. And 
she said my children were in college, they were well grown, and I thought, well, I don't need to call them, but Laura Bush said so. So she said, I called my daughter, and she said, oh, mother, thanks so much for calling. So I think people did really want to reach out. Everyone did, and they wanted to hear the comfort of the voices of the people they loved. Yeah. I imagine one of the challenges when you become First Lady is moving into the White House and trying to make it into a home for your husband and family. So how do you make a 132 room that we call the People's House your home? Mrs. Bush. Well, I, I took my favorite sort of furniture with me. Took my needlepoint rug and paintings for that one room, the room off the bedroom, so, sort of a family room, some kind of family room, 18 foot ceilings, and, <laughs> and put my own curtains or drapes there. And do you know what? They wouldn't let me take them with me when we left. <laughs> Matched my couches, but anyway. Uh, Somebody get Mrs. Bush a lawyer. <laughs> too late, too late. Now the couch is almost worn out after all those years. But we made it home. It was very nice. I honestly think that Jerry Ford was the first president who slept in the same bedroom with his wife. That's right. So, that family room was your father's bedroom. <laughs> well, family bedroom. George and I slept next door, and with the dog. <laughs> but it, you make it home, and I must say, they're so sweet. The people who work in the White House, and when we went back, and I bet they were there, Linda, when you were there. Some of the same people were there when we went back with George and Laura eight years later, or whatever it was. They, they welcomed us home as though family was back. It's, a, it's very much a family feeling, I it, think. It really is. And when uh, Mrs. Johnson, when Linda brought Mrs. Johnson to tour the White House, uh, when I lived there, um, I got to take her on a tour, and she had a stroke by then and had lost her speech, but she was still so expressive, the way she would put her hands together if she saw a painting that she liked. Or I remember we looked at your dad's portrait, and she sort of put her arms up like that to the portrait of her husband. But when you drove up, the doorman at the White House, um, Mr. German, Wilson German, w had come back and was work in retirement, was working as the doorman. But when the Johnsons lived there, he'd been the mater d. So he, we, he and I are on the, you know, at the door as you all get out of the car. And he literally falls into your mother's arms. She's in, the, in a wheelchair coming up. So that's the kind of staff that work there for president after president. And you really do feel like when you see them, you're going to fall into their arms you're again. Home again. It's great. Well, uh, Mrs. Bush, in your memoir, you quoted Lady Bird Johnson. You, you alluded to this quote earlier as saying it would, uh, about the role of First Lady, it would be sad to pass up such a bully pulpit. It's a fleeting chance to do something that makes your heart sing. I so, believe that. I believe, uh, I think that was a great lesson. And I, I did ask our staff to plan something every single day that helped somebody. Just by having, um, I don't know, handicapped children come by, it, it helped. Now granted, they didn't put it in the paper, but nonetheless, we. <laughs> We did do it, and it went to the hometown papers. But we tried something every day that helps somebody. Because you do have the bully pulpit, then it's a mistake if you don't use it, truthfully. But your passion was literacy. Still is. Still Just is. had a big fundraiser in Dallas two or three nights ago. No, it's, I, in my opinion, and certainly Laura has done much more than I have, but. Every single thing would be better in this world if more people could read, write, and comprehend. There's just no question about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, Mrs. Bush was referring to the foundation that's named for her, the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, which thrives today. Laura, your passion was reading as well. What, uh, talk about what you did to further that cause in your... Well, I your days in the uh, founded the national—I mean, the Texas Book Festival when George was governor. And so, right after I moved in, the librarian of Congress called me and said, "Don't you want to have a national book festival?" 
And I said yes, and of course it was great to work with the Library of Congress to, to uh, found a festival. And it goes on today. It was uh, the end of September this year. It's now a two-day festival. When we started it, it was just one. And it drew 200,000 people to the National Mall. And I think that's great. That's one of the things I love. I love it that that book festival and the Texas Book Festival are really institutions now and, yeah. and are going on, you know, you great. You took it to Russia. That's right. And then I've, Mrs. Putin came to our book festival, and then she hosted a book festival that Sharia Blair and I from, uh, went to. Right. You both became uh, the wives of wartime presidents during the course of your tenures in the White House. 9-11 was a defining moment in your husband's presidency and in our nation's history. Mm. How did your role change after 9-11? Well, it changed so much. I, was, I gave people a tour of our library yesterday. We're giving hard hat tours. We're very close to finishing the building. And I walked through the museum part. And our museum is set up where the very first part, there's a little biographical part. And then you walk in and uh, there's something on No Child Left Behind, the legislation that was passed on tax cuts, which were passed on uh, the National Book Festival, which was on September 8th, the first one, 2001. Our first state dinner, which was for Mexico on September 6th, 2001. And then the um, first tee ball on the White House lawn, there's George's big baseball collection. So you walk into the museum and you walk through these very happy and sort of optimistic, all domestic um, issues, and then you turn a corner, and it's September 11th. Mm. And we have the huge uh, beam from the World Trade Center from the 83rd floor where the plane hit um, in the uh, second tower in the middle of the, um, uh, the big display on September 11th, and then the videos that follow from the first moment of the first plane to Shanksville, and then the big videos that go for the days up until the 20th when George spoke to the uh, joint session of Congress uh, after September 11th. So really, it was something we didn't expect at all. We really expected that George's presidency would be focused only on domestic issues. We didn't, you know, we weren't, and in a lot of ways, you're never prepared for that. Um, that you know, that sort of shocking happening. And of course, it changed everything for us. And it was the whole focus, really, of our eight years, the whole idea of terrorism. You write very movingly uh, about the morning of September 11th uh, in Spoken from the Heart. And you talk about being with Ted Kennedy, of all right. people, on Capitol Hill. Uh, what do you recall about that morning? Well, I was going that morning. I mean, I really, when I looked back and wrote the book and looked at those months leading up to it, we were doing what we thought we would be doing. And um, I was going to Capitol Hill to brief the Senate Committee on Education, and Ted Kennedy was the chairman of the committee on early childhood education. I'd hosted a summit that summer with early childhood specialists. And so just as I was getting in the car, my agent, Secret Service agent, leaned over to me and said, a plane has just hit the World Trade Center. But we didn't really know what that meant. I mean, we got into the car and went on to the Capitol uh, because we just speculated that it was some horrible accident or some really strange accident. But by the time we got to the Capitol, we knew the second plane had hit and we knew that it was a terrorist attack. So I joined Senator Kennedy in his office, and then Senator Jed, Judd Gregg from New Hampshire, who's one of our very close friends, came in. He was the minority chairman of the committee. And uh, Senator Kennedy kept, talked the whole time and just kept up a steady stream of small talk and showed me photographs on the wall. He showed me a letter that his brother Jack had written when they were younger kids. And Jack had written this letter to his mother, and he said, Teddy's getting fat. <laughs> and Teddy had laughed about this. And I never knew, I mean, I never knew if this was his mechanism to, because he'd had so many shocks in his own life of dealing with this kind of tragedy or if he thought I would fall apart if he didn't, you know, just keep acting like everything was normal and just, 
you know, give me a tour of his office and talk about the history of his office. And, mm. and the whole time he talked, Judd Gregg and I would just sort of look at each other over, um, mm. you know, his shoulder because we were sick. I mean, we literally felt sick. But then we went out and spoke to the press uh, to say that the, sent the, you know, the briefing, obviously, was just postponed, you know, already. It was just going to be postponed. The terrorists weren't going to make us cancel anything. And, um, you know, and, and then, of course, T Senator Kennedy went into the very, you know, said exactly what he should have said in that kind of um, situation. And then we went back to his office for a while, and then we went, the three of us went to Judd Gregg's office on our way out of the building while the Secret Service decided what to do uh, with me because they didn't know, they, you know, first we thought we'd go back to the White House, and then people at the White House were told to run and did. And um, so then I went to a secure location. But of course, what none of us knew was that that plane that crashed in Shanksville probably was headed to the Capitol. Right. And our Capitol is so exposed, you know, on a hill like it is. Thank God for those people on that plane. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Bush, you and President Bush had spent the night at the White House, the mm -hmm. night of September right. 10th at mm -hmm. the White House. Mm -hmm. What was your experience on 9-11? Like you, you write about this in your, in your second memoir. We uh, climbed on an airplane to go to the Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, I guess. We both had speaking engagements, yeah. I recall. And then halfway there, they announced that the, a plane had crashed, and then another one. And they stopped and left us in a little town. I've forgotten where now. But, uh, I think it was outside of Milwaukee, is that right? Yeah, outside of Milwaukee. Yeah. But we were put, put in a funny old motel and sort of sat in this motel. Finally, George said, we've been there forever. We talked to George, and uh, they said, we said, well, we got to get out and get some fresh air. So we did go walk across the street. There was a public golf course. It was fascinating. Nobody on the golf course either cared or knew because they all played golf, and we sort of mentioned there was a little problem, and oh yeah. We went to have dinner that night at uh, a restaurant, a little place next door to the motel, and it was very sweet because people came up, leaned over, and I loved this, there was a guy in his t-shirt, a big, fat, heavy truck driver, t-shirt with hairy armpits, <laughs> leaning over George <laughs> and saying to him, sir, I want you to know I'm going to back your son no matter what. I'm with you all the way. And I was thinking, George is, I'm sure he's thrilled with what he's saying, but the pit in his face is <laughs> not exactly his favorite. But people came up and said the sweetest things to us, truthfully, really sweet things to us. And then somehow or other, because no planes were taking off, as you recall, I don't quite know how it worked, but somebody persuaded the government that we should be allowed to go back to Kenny Bunkport, that it was safer there, which of course is ridiculous because we're sitting a point out in the water, anybody can come get us, but anyway. But we got to go home the next, uh, did we spend the night there? I forgot. I think you spent one night. But it had brown sheets. I don't like brown sheets. <laughs> Very spoiled. <laughs> I do remember that. How, anyway. did, how did your role change when the Gulf War broke out? My, my role? Yes, your role, in yes. In the Gulf War? Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> well, it's just like, I, I went to visit lots of camps, like Laura did, and visited with the soldiers' families, and military families. Uh, you know, I have never been prouder of my husband because he set up he really taught us how to keep the peace, which was he talked to people from all over the world. And so we had a great coalition, and, and it worked. I mean, it really worked. And I think I've just, because I think George Bush 
W. Bush is the second greatest president, <laughs> but I think there's no question that my husband is the greatest president that ever was. <laughs> yeah. I believe that. I believe, I believe that. Well, I remember when George and I, when the Gulf War broke out and George and I lived in Dallas and I can remember standing over the television in our kitchen and the, how nervous and anxious we were. Um, you know, how, I mean, you do, it's just very, very high tension um, anytime uh, there's any sort of war in the United States. But when your father or your husband is the president and commander in chief, uh, you know, the, it's magnified. And um, I remember how anxious we were then. And then, of course, I felt that same sort of anxiety for months on end while we lived at the White House. Mrs. Bush, you watched your... You just call me Barbara. <laughs> I saw that look before. I'm not calling you Barbara. I just want to embarrass him. <laughs> uh, I, you saw your husband go through the Gulf War. and You saw your son go through 9-11 and wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Is it harder to be emotionally the wife of a president or the mother of mother, a president? The mother. How so? And the child. And the child. For us. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. I'm, we I'm nobody's we child. We president. <laughs> <laughs> president Bush criticized. No, I think it's, it's harder when difficult. you're the mother. Yeah. But it wasn't easy, ever. It's never easy when you send somebody else's child into no war. I mean, it's just not, it's not easy. But I, I, I still think that George did it. And, and all circumstances change. You can never do the same thing twice. But in this case, I really think he did a superb job, as did our allies. They were wonderful. No law, lives were lost at that first. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Bush, talk about being the chair. I've spoken to your husband about the most difficult days that he's had politically. And he says, without question, the most difficult time he ever had was when his father lost, lost the election in, in 1992. Is it more painful? Was it more painful for you to watch your in-laws? Yeah, it than really was. Your was. was it, it is. Husband I mean, didn't lose. I think what happens. <laughs> yeah. But also, when you're there, when you're the actual ones living in the White House, you know there there's just a lot more than when you're just watching on television or reading all the press about the person you love, and you see how they're characterized in a way that you know they're not. Right. And that's very, very difficult. And, that, and that's just a fact of life in the United States and politics. And I knew it. In fact, that was the reason that I was slightly hesitant when George wanted to run for president, because I knew that that's what happens uh, to the people who serve there. Jenna said earlier uh, when she was talking that, you know, this is for Jenna and Barbara. I mean, their grandfather and their father were in those positions, and they saw how one-dimensional we make our leaders. And, you know, that's really what she likes to talk about, that everyone that's there is a father and a husband and a wife and a mother and, you know, has all these other roles that make them real, the real people that they are. I, I honestly think, and certainly this last election is a good example, People spoke, move on, get on with it, do other things. But I'm tired now of the election. I want to get on and have people do positive things and not be ugly and not be mean. <laughs> the enforcer gets a little rude with her friends when they want to rehash it all again. And that's how Barr was when Gampy lost. Barr just said, well, that was it. Let's move on. Got to move on. And that's her personality, which is actually very smart, I think, psychologically. Oh, what good's the other do? <laughs> <laughs> well, other people might, well, you know, sort of worry about Life that. is good. Mm -hmm. Well, that dovetails nicely to the next subject I'd like to explore, which is one of the most memorable uh, moments when you were first lady is when you made that wonderful commencement speech at Wellesley College with Ray Gorbachev. And in it, you advised the graduates that they should do everything that they can to find the joy in life. So how do you find the joy in the White House when the burdens 
are so formidable? Well, if you're lucky like we were, you have faith, family, and friends. And we were very lucky and had strong faith, unbelievable family, and I realize that more every day, and wonderful friends. So what more could you ask? That, that, that strengthens, don't you think? Well, you certainly had lots of friends. But that's really true. I mean, that is really true. Uh, all of those things, you're comforted by that. You're comforted by the American people. I mean, as many terrible things as you read, every single place we went, people would say, we're praying for you. People, Americans pray for the President of the United States. It's very comforting to hear that. And you hear it over and over every place you go. So, you know, there, there's a lot of, you get a lot of strength from the American people, I think. And um, it's not just the way you read it in the newspaper or hear it on TV. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the ways that you seem to, to, to find joy is through humor. And one of the most memorable moments uh -oh. in your tenure as First Lady, Laura, was when you made that wonderful speech at the White House Correspondents' Dinner about life in the White House with George W. Bush. Can you talk a little bit about that speech and what you said that evening? When I was a desperate housewife? When, you, yeah. <laughs> when I said that Mr. <laughs> Excitement here had already gone to bed at 9 o'clock <laughs> and that Lynn Cheney and I had gone to... Chippendales, <laughs> and that I wouldn't even tell them, except we ran into Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg there, and so. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, but, I, but after that, every time we traveled overseas for a year, the head of state we were visiting would say, desperate housewife. <laughs> you know, they were shocked. I mean, it was shocking to people in other countries that we have these roasts of our presidents and there are about five a year, every year, if you go to all of them. So where everyone stands up and makes fun of the president, and then he has to stand up and make fun of himself. <laughs> it's a funny story. Now, after President Bush uh, lost the 1992 election, you invited Dana Carvey to the White House. And David, Dana Carvey, of course, did that wonderful impression <laughs> of President Bush on Saturday Night Live. What well, was wonderful to those some of us watching it at any rate. Uh, how did that invitation come about? Well, George did that. But he, the whole White House was so sad and glum. And of course, they're looking for jobs. They've all been fired <laughs> by the, the vote. And they were just so dreary. So he asked Dana Carvey, and we hid him in the White House. We took him to... Uh, the Kennedy Center honors, but we hid him. Nobody knew he was staying at the White House. So when, you know, he's an itty bitty little guy. <laughs> and when they, we gathered all the White House staff in the big East Room, and then they went, doo -doo 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 -doo. ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, and this itty bitty little guy <laughs> walks in. <laughs> and he was funny, and, and he was very cute, and. George imitated him, and he imitated George, and anyway, it, it raised the level of feeling, and it made a difference. They, people are so loyal and so sweet. They're still loyal and sweet. Some in this room who are very still loyal to George, both Georges, but I'm thinking of my George this time. <laughs> but I mean, they are still, and they're very loyal to him because he's loyal to them, and so is George W. I mean. That makes a big difference in life. But they needed to be cheered up. Things were glum. They're all looking for jobs. <laughs> That's very sad. Well, you don't know they that. They all found them, though. <laughs> <laughs> Some. Laura, what was the most challenging moment that you came upon in the White House? Well, I mean, obviously, September 11th would have been it for us. And those weeks afterwards where we met the people who'd lost somebody on September 11th. Mm. And and then always to be in war, you know, to have to worry every single night when you get in bed about your troops, to think about them at night and pray for them. And, um, you know, I would feel so guilty when I knew they were, I was getting in these, and that you didn't even mention this, but one of the true luxuries are the fresh new iron sheets every day on the bed in the White House. I like that. 
<laughs> and think about our troops sleeping in the sand in a tent somewhere in Afghanistan. And one time I told them I was having lunch with some troops at a, in a military base, and I said that, and they said, oh, Miss Bush, we're doing what we want to do. You know, that's where we want to be. But, we have um, two grandsons who've been to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and home, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Bush, what did you find to be the most challenging moment during your tenure as first? Just week? exactly what Laura said, I think. The, uh, well, because we had an unmarried daughter at that time, and that was fairly challenging. <laughs> But uh, Doro had gotten a divorce, which was very sad. And uh, people, it, well, I don't know if it's challenging or not, but sort of, because people dated her, who I don't think really were that interested. It was very complicated. And her uncles would say, oh, this is the most wonderful fellow in the world. You've got to go out with him, Doro, I'll set up a date, which they would do. And the first thing they'd say to her was something like, you know the thing I don't like about your dad? <laughs> <laughs> At which time Doro would stand up and say, you know, my babysitter for my two children has to leave early. I just came to tell you I can't have a date <laughs> late. But that was hard for her. I don't think it was the most challenging, but it was sort of fun. And we loved having children living there. We have children now living near us in Houston. Makes a difference. Or what is the most indelible memory of your White House years? Well, there are so many. I mean, it's really hard to pick one. Um, I mean, those kind of memories, the memories of meeting people. I mean, we had so many. We had a lot of tragedy. The uh, Columbia ship, you know, spaceship and the I mean, just so many that it's hard to, to um, uh, the ones that are really sad that you, you'll never forget. But there are many, many happy times, too. We had really, we, our friends always came. We had, we had 12 White House, I mean, Camp David Christmases. I'm sure Wonderful. it's the, the four years that the Bushes were there and our eight, and eight years. years and the Bushes were there. That's right. And so we have a record that no one will ever break, I think, on the numbers of... <laughs> Christmases at Camp David. So there were many happy occasions as well. And, and you've got to explain to them, I don't want you to think that you paid for all these guests we had, because we sure had a lot of them. We paid for every bite they ate. Now, an egg cost 18 cents, and they were <laughs> itemized. So, but every bite our guests ate that was not official, Laura and George, or George and Barbara paid for. But they were minor. and. It made all the difference, I think, in, in, in enjoying or well, giving you some kind of reasonable peace to have friends. I but did have a, this is a very personal memory, but I had a really good friend who I grew up with. She was my next door neighbor in Midland, and she lived here actually, and she had breast cancer. And I'd seen her um, over the holidays, Christmas holidays, and said, we ought to have a mini reunion at the White House. And she said, well, let's do it sooner rather than later. Mm. So for Valentine's, that February 14th, we had uh, maybe five couples or six couples of our friends that we had grown up with, that we'd known our whole lives in Midland, for a Valentine dinner in the Red Room, the perfect place to have a Valentine dinner. And I was so happy I did that. We they actually, of course, all these friends spent the whole weekend with us, and then we had the fun Valentine dinner, and then a few months after that, our, my friend died. But uh, to have that memory of having the Valentine dinner with my longtime friend was fun. Laura, when I interviewed you a couple of years ago at the Texas Book Festival, uh, you talked about bringing your friends into the Oval Office yeah. for the first time. Would you mind telling that story? So we, George and I, since we did both grow up in Midland, had a lot of the same friends. My best friends now were in the second grade with George then. And, and um, so George loved to tell how the, he would have these friends like Mike Proctor and those kind of friends into to, uh, the Oval Office. And they'd come in and say, Ka Bush, I can't believe I'm here. And then they'd look at him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Mrs. Bush. But there is something really great about having the longtime friends, that kind of history of friendship where they'd known you at every stage of your life long before politics. And, Nobody ever um, said that about my husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they always thought he would end up uh, Everybody there, thought they? he would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Did you tell him George's new vice? That's exciting. George has taken up painting. Oil He's an oil painting. painter. And he's good. That's the most extraordinary thing. That's what a mother thing. would say. <laughs> no, he really is good. Well, the truth is he gave up cigars and he had to find some pastime. <laughs> well, I heard he was still chewing them here, though. Well, eating them. <laughs> now, the enforcer would have stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Bush, is there one particular White House memory for you that burns brighter than the others? Well, I think Christmas at the White House was spectacular. I, I loved it. And I loved the uh, Christmas trees that had all the fake snow on it. And the, We had a lot of grandchildren there, Marshall and Walker and uh, Sam and Ellie. And Sam was sort of mischievous, still is, actually. <laughs> And they, and Jenna and Barbara, and they had snowball fights, and, and the wonderful people who came to the White House every year, same people as competitive. They came every year, and they decorated for a week before they closed down everything. They made huge wreaths, and whatever your motif was for Christmas, why they, they made whatever it was, whether they were uh, Needlepoint Christmas or... St. Nicholas Christmas or whatever it was, they worked for a week making that White House a jewel. And it's so exciting. And then you have people who come to play bells downstairs or to choirs that sing. For half an hour, different groups come in all the time for the tours, and they have these unbelievable musical or wonderful times. It was great. You would hear the music waft upstairs, upstairs. from them. If you really but liked it, I you'd remembered come when uh, we won, a, I mean, we went, of course, every Christmas to the White House when they lived there, but one year was, I don't know what year it was, the character, the whole huge Christmas tree in the blue room, the big White House story Christmas book tree, Christmas. were covered with storybook characters. Storybook Christmas. That the, that the White House you know, florists and ushers and electrician, electricians and everyone had built. So I borrowed those for the second, for our second White House Christmas. And it, you know, I loved the idea really, like any of us would use our mother's or our parents' Christmas ornaments uh, later, be passed on and have those ornaments. And it was really fun to be able to use yours that Now, if year. you're at the George Bush Library, you will see the Needlepoint Christmas. It's up this year going to be. And up. so all of those wonderful ornaments are part of the National Archives. And so Alan Lowe, who's the um, head of the George W. Bush Library, will be unpacking all of those things when he moves in. And so we can set those Did up you get at different to keep Christmases. Them? They, they're very stingy about letting you keep them. No, you have yours. Do we have them? Yeah, sure. That's where I borrowed the storybook character. I'm glad we <laughs> lent them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I know the needlepoint is, is up because people, hundreds of people made needlepoint characters. They're wonderful. Laura, you talked about how it's painful often when you see uh, your husband characterized a certain way in the press. What is the biggest misconception or what was the biggest misconception about President Bush during his time in office? You know, that he was sort of a heedless cowboy caricature. That was it, I think. Yeah. What would, what would Don't mention it be? to me. Makes me so mad. Yeah, we, who wants to even talk about this? No. <laughs> we know that's George. not a good question. <laughs> what was the biggest You're misconception one... about President Bush? Mr. There was none. He was a saint. <laughs> <laughs> but my son, very unfair. I, I, I really think the, I think the blame game, don't even mention it. I'm sorry I brought it up. Forget it. <laughs> it's just unfair. He's a very spiritual, and I hear people say something about he's a drunk. He hadn't had a drink in 30 years. 
Don't even bring those. Don't even bring it up. <laughs> Don't you, bring it up. You both talked about Camp David. Uh, what makes Camp David so special? Well, it's beautiful, for one thing, in the Catoctin Mountains in Maryland, very, very pretty. And, and for the president and family of the president, where you're really in a bubble and it's hard to go out or go for a walk, it's great to be there, where you can be outside all day and go for walks and lots of sports, which are really fun for our family. Bowling. We always had the bowling family bowling tournaments. Volleyball. They had a lot of it was fun. fun things. But don't ever think for a moment that they were away from being president. Because I remember it was there when they called and said Noriega had been caught. I mean, they're just, you're never, the president is never away mm -hmm. from the job. That's right. But at least he can put on his polo shirt and walk. But you're never away. Uh, let's flash forward for a minute. You, you took the good works that you did in the White House into your post-White House years. Laura, talk about uh, what you're doing at the Bush Institute. Well, we're focusing on four policy issues that were the most important to us when George was president. One's education and one's economic growth and uh, human freedom and global health. And I'll just tell you about one of our initiatives, the Global Health Initiative. Uh, we partnered with um, the US State Department and with UN AIDS, and we're adding the testing and treatment for cervical cancer, which is the leading cause of cancer death in Africa, to the PEPFAR platform, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief platform that's already set up now uh, because of PEPFAR that was started when George was president. So we've been to Africa twice since we've uh, been home to launch um, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, in um, uh, Botswana, Zambia, and Tanzania. And we'll continue to, to uh, launch it in other African countries. So we, last um, summer, we refurbished a clinic in Zambia, and then women lined up to be tested for cervical cancer. And that, now I hear they're demanding to be uh -huh. tested because it got a lot of publicity and because they know people who've died from cervical cancer. So that's, we're building on what we did when we were at the White House with that initiative. And then, of course, other really great things, but that's been fun and interesting to be able to do. And life-saving. Right, absolutely. Mrs. Bush, talk about what you're doing through the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Well, actually, my children have thrown me out. <laughs> and I'm now honorary chair. But what I'd sort of like to talk about is the thing I'm proudest of. I'm proudest of the fact that our grandchildren, and I'm sure to forget one, but Lauren has started the FEED program and has fed, I think, 68 million children around the world. And Pierce, these is Neil's children, and Pierce has, uh, is heading the Big Brother, Big Sister program in Houston, trying to raise $10 million along with all the rest of our grandchildren. <laughs> Uh, in the next year or so, and he has a little brother who's he's had for three years, and uh, Lauren, oh, I did say Lauren, didn't I? Yeah, you said Lauren. Uh, Bar uh, Barbara, I'm sure you heard today, has the Global Health Program. She started out wanting to be an architect, but traveled with her parents, saw the need of people dying when they didn't need to, and got a took up global health. Jenna worked for UNICEF and has taught in school. And uh, I've done one, uh, two of them have gone into the military and gone to Afghanistan. Uh, keep helping me, I need help. The, anyway, they're, they're, they're very Oh, Ellie works for the Conan Foundation, which has had a terrible problem this last year and stuck loyally with them. They have saved millions of lives and because of one stupid something, why people forget that, and they shouldn't forget it, because they have saved, truthfully, millions of people's lives. And I'm trying to think, I have a lot of other ones, but they're not old enough, I guess. But they've all gone into public service, and that is a copying their saintly grandfather. <laughs> Now, you talked about your relief and the fact that the election is over. Oh. When we did the last conference, 
First Ladies Conference at the George W. Bush Library, you expressed dismay over the fact that compromise in Washington has become a dirty word. It has. Do you have hope for Washington uh, in the future? If you don't have hope, I guess you don't have anything. What? But yes, they're going to have to compromise. They just have to. I mean, and it isn't a dirty word. It's part of the way you get things done in business and in life. I must say, for me, who never listens to anyone else's arguments, that's pr pretty bad. But <laughs> just ask Pierce. He and I argue all the time. But I would compromise. I think compromise is very important. Laura, you've only been away from Washington for, for four years, but has it changed since you and President Bush left Washington? Not really. Not really. <laughs> That's right. When we had the last conference, it was nominally at the, at the George W. Bush Library, but there, is, there was no library uh, yet. We're, we'll cut the ribbon on that library and welcome it into the family of 12 and soon to be 13 presidential libraries in April. Talk a little bit about your presidential library, if you would. Well, it's almost finished. I think the archives will start to move in the uh, Monday after Thanksgiving, which is great, which I think will take several months to move everything in. The museum installation will be installed. The museum will be installed, and uh, then we'll open on April 25th. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Bob Stern was our architect. He's the dean of the Yale Architecture School. We started, uh, when we started working with him on the design, we immediately began also with the landscape architect and taking after our mentor, Lady Bird, our whole um, 14 acres is planted in native plants, native grasses, native uh, trees to our area. They just sowed the blue bonnet seeds, so hopefully we'll have a bloom of those for the opening. Uh, the lady, we worked with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to uh, establish a native turf grass. It's a four, I think, the seeds from four different Texas native grasses, and this will be the first big installation of uh, this grass that we've tested for the last few years at North Haven Gardens in Dallas, had a test plot of, and it should be a very hardy turf grass that can stand up to a lot of wear, but doesn't need to be watered very much or, or um, mowed very often. Oh. So that's all really beautiful. I think it's really going to be lovely. Uh, we have the full-scale oval office that you'll be able to walk into and sit at the desk and have your picture made. And then we have a Texas Rose Garden. So you'll walk out of the oval office just in the same aspect that the president would walk out of the no oval office into a rose garden. But ours, of course, instead of Crape, uh, crab apples, I think we have crepe myrtles, and instead of tulip magnolias, we have southern magnolias. And, uh, so it's really going to be far. Instead of the boxwood, we have dwarf yopon, so it really will be a Texas variety of the rose garden. But it'll be after you've walked through the part about September 11th, and then the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in the museum, and then uh, you can walk out at that point, go through the awful office and walk outside. The Rose Garden's secure. It's part of the actual museum tour. So you can go outside and be refreshed uh, after that um, part of the museum that I think will be very, very affecting. And um, I think people will want to go outside and, and reflect on, um, on what happened on September 11th and then come back in and finish the museum tour. We're a little myopic when it comes to our presidents, and it takes us a long time to see the forest for the trees and assess their legacies objectively. But Mrs. Bush, I wonder if you can offer your thoughts on how your husband will be remembered in history. I think he'll be remembered very well. I, I really do. Uh, I, I should say one more thing about George W., which people I don't think know but he calls his father at least four times a week, which he never did before in spite of reading that he called for advice. But now he calls him because he's getting a little bit older and not so well. He calls him at least four times a week, which is very touching to me and wonderful for his dad. I want you to know that about him. I don't think he has that reputation, but he should. <laughs> no, he should because he's been, they all are great. I mean, he and Doro are the... <laughs> The biggest, well, they're all good. They all call. But George W. is really wonderful about it. And it's, 
his dad is very proud of him and loves him more than life. But what was your next question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was asking you about President Bush's legacy. How do oh, you think he'll be remembered? I in think he'll have a very good legacy because I think he's taught, not that people took this lesson, but I think he taught them that you should communicate and that you should talk. I remember the very first thing he did as president, practically, was call other heads of state and just chat with them. He said someone told him to do that, and then you feel when you need them as a friend, You've talked to them, you know them. And I remember waking up at Camp David one morning and hearing George say, bonjour, Francois, comment allez-vous? And thinking, my God, he is president. He's calling the president of France. <laughs> now, his French wasn't quite up to it, but <laughs> anyway, he, I, I, think, I think they'll remember him as a gentle, wise, kind man who is a saint. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't chew cigars, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, can you offer your thoughts on on uh, uh, the man who chews cigars? Well, I his, yeah, uh, exactly. Who his, actually eats tobacco? Um, well, what, how will he be remembered? I think history? he'll be remembered for somebody that loved freedom, and that knew how important freedom is for our country, for our world, and who just who's tough, and who kept us safe. I think that's what they'll remember. That's big. But I also say. think they'll remember that he has a heart, and I think that's what PEPFAR and the other global health initiatives are that he started. I think they, he knows that America has to lead yeah. and that we just have to. And if we don't, no one else will. And that it's really important because of our values that are, you know, our, how important we think freedom is and democracy is. And, and how we think, how important we think our each of our own responsibility as citizens is to our country, and that's really not like every other country. Right. So it's important for us to be able to let people see what our values really are. Before I uh, thank our honored guests, uh, you see behind me the White House here, and the White House is not only a place for presidents and first ladies, but for families and staff members, and we have many in the audience that I'd like to just recognize quickly. Uh, two family members, Steve Ford and our own Linda Johnson Robb are in attendance. And we have tonight staff members from the Johnson, uh, Ford, Bush 41, Clinton, and Bush 43 administrations. Would you stand up and be, be recognized for your service, please? Now, as many of you know, we are undergoing a major renovation uh, of our core exhibit on uh, Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. And in the Great Hall, where Laura Welsh paid her respects to President Johnson and met Linda, Lucy, and Lady Bird Johnson will be the portraits of all of our presidents and first lady and an exhibit on the tradition of the presidency and the legacies of our first ladies. And I can tell you that when we look at your portraits, we will remember this very special evening oh. and both of you very Thank fondly. You very Thank you so much, much for being here. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks.